consumerism. So we are live. And today we are going to talk about the toxicity of America. It's toxic, y'all. And that toxicity is ubiquitous, it's everywhere, and uh, it's in the systems, it's in the institutions. And for folks who look like us, it's killing us. It truly is. And we need, you know, we talk about getting your money straight so you can get out of there and move abroad and feel good. We also talk about your health, getting your health together because folks, these hills up in, in Portugal ain't no joke, but, even if you lived in Flatland, you want to get your health together and feel good about yourself. And the other thing is detoxing from America, starting now. Yeah. While you're in America, knowing all the different things to, to watch out for, admitting to yourself. Because, you know, when we were talking this week about this subject, I didn't realize how it had really totally affected me. I know you know. <laughs> I have a brilliant wife, what can I say? But before we get started, maybe we should introduce ourselves. Okay. All right. All right, y'all. For those of you who don't know, my name is Halisi. And I'm Rick. And welcome to our Black Utopia. On our channel, we talk about money, travel, and retiring abroad as we build generational wealth. Um, for those of you who are very new to our channel, <laughs> very, very, very new, new, you might not know that about six and a half years ago, Rick and I had a crazy wake up call. We were getting close to retirement age. We looked at our money and it looked crazy. Crazy. But we did get our financial act together and we went from negative 22,000 to over 1 million in net worth as of today. <laughs> But that's not all. That's not all. That's not all. The other thing that we did, which we weren't we weren't even conscious, so consciously aware of until someone asked us, is that we started healing from the toxicity of America, right? Yeah. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, hey, y'all who are in the chat, we see you, we love you. Um, but we're going to go ahead and get started. I want to show you something first before we before we get into the nitty gritty, I'm just, okay, spoiler alert. Some of you are gonna feel uncomfortable. Some of you are gonna feel defensive and we're asking that you let all of that go um, and really think about these situations and the questions that we ask because we're gonna crowdsource this. And so we really, really, really wanna hear from you. Definitely wanna hear from you. But first I wanna show you something. So let me share screen. Da, share. See if I can get this to play without the commercial. Did you catch that? And the reason I'm going to show you some more. The reason why I wanted to show you that is because what we have to deal with as Americans from the continent of Africa, our original people were from Africa, is so subtle that sometimes it gets into our psyche, it gets into our subconscious, and we are so unaware. So unaware, yeah. So I don't know if you caught the message in the Heineken commercial, let us know in the chat what you saw. We're going to, I'm going to add something else to the stream. Take a look at this. What do you see? What I see are two moms, but one has a husband or a dad of the baby and one does not. Hmm. How about this one? You guys have seen this one before, I'm sure. I hadn't seen this. So when, you, when I saw it today, it shocked me. And 
Did anything ever come out about it? Did you hear anything? Oh, yeah. They, you know, they, they issued a public apology. Wait a minute. Let me make sure you can see what we're seeing. Okay. So this was the first one that I showed. And I'm not sure if you could see that. Um, so I want to make sure you could see that. And I guess you guys did see that because I see Savage. This was not that long ago, obviously. It was in this century, right? Sometimes we see things and consciously we rationalize it, but subconsciously the message is very clear. This was during Katrina. Same actions, but the media really communicated it very differently. You mm -hmm. see three people in the water doing the exact same thing, but under one headline, people are finding supplies. On the other side, They're looting. we are looting. Yeah. This is typical. This is typical in the media. And if you are not aware of it, then you can't fight it. This is typical. So when protests happen and when protests turn into uprisings, we're thugs, we're animals, we're destroying our own community. And then someone's going to say, and where are the black leaders who are supposed to be da ba 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 whoop de woo de woo but when folks who don't look like us do the same exact thing, different adjectives are used. Mm -hmm. Rowdy. Oh, you know, boys will be boys. Booze filled revelers. They're reveling. Just up to mischief. <laughs> yeah, locker room banter. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> mischief. Turning over uh, a police car. It's just mischief. They didn't mean anything by it. No, no. I'm sure you all remember this movie called The Blind Side. And the I, I read um, interviews of the football player who was depicted in this picture saying he was embarrassed by it, that this was not like the life that he had. Um, but regardless of that fact, um, Look at the imagery right here. Now, one could say, well, we needed to put the little boy up on a bleacher because um, to get the shot. They could have been sitting down. That It could have gone that way, but they chose to shoot it this way just to make sure that we know no matter how old the person is, if they are of the majority, they are above us. And then lastly, so this is from Hidden Figures, and I, for some reason, the GIF is not playing, but that's Kevin Costner right there. And if you guys saw Hidden Figures, you remember him coming and swinging at the For Coloreds Only or White Ladies Only, whatever, sign in front of the restroom and pulling it down and, oh, you know, the audience goes crazy. Well, this did not happen in real life. No, it didn't. The story does not go that way, but for some reason, Hollywood felt it necessary that after these women were so persecuted and so discriminated against, that they have some kind of savior figure to do the right thing. And thus, you know, um, making amends for the collective. This did not happen, y'all. She never ran across the the campus to go to the Blacks Only. She just went right to the, the nearest bathroom and said, deal with it. That's what happened in real life. So let's talk about the toxicity of America. I want to know, did, did they get the first one? The Act the Beer commercial? Oh, yeah. Did you guys see what the deal was what the message was, what the what, message was what with message with from with the heineken commercial let me see let me go over there and see if i can play it again 
for you. Um, all right, I'm gonna share screen. Let's see, da, 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 share and play. One more time. What do we see? He's got to make sure. Oh, look who it passes. Well, not for him. Not for her. Because lighter is better. Yeah, that's the message. Who got that on the first try? When, when we first showed it, all right? <laughs> okay, let's go ahead and say hello to some people and lighten it up just a little bit, just a little bit. So, hey, Ocean View, good to see you. Thank you for the compliment. Hey, Auntie, Auntie Trey, Trey, how you doing? Regina, glad to be here, not working today, so able to catch live, yay. Right. Very good, very good. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Hey, Maria, hey, good Maria. to see you. KB. Hello. Peyton Fit. Hello, hello, hello. Alexandria, Indeed. good to see you. Good to Pinky. see you. Pinky, either it's a new name or a new icon because it looks new. So welcome. If you're not new, I'm sorry. Hey, Vanessa, good to see hey, you. Vanessa. Sorry you missed our live yesterday, but I did upload that. So it should be in the Thinkific platform. What we're talking about is our Beyond the Blame class. If you, you can still enroll, it's not too late. Um, for the Money Mindset Makeover. Hey, Kelly, good to see you. Jeanette, hello, everyone. Hope you're enjoying your Sunday. I love the expression over his face in here. <laughs> He's done with the US. Y'all, hey, Vicky, is some of this stuff is giving me PTSD because I haven't looked at this stuff in a long time, but you know, um, someone, one of, one of you guys asked us, how are we healing from the United States? And so we thought we would answer the question today. How are we healing from the toxicity of the United States? Um, hey, Jeanette. Oh, yay. Sun is finally shining. Yeah, it's, it was shining here too. Hey, Meriton. Good to see you. Uh, Saida, I hope is how you pronounce your name. And Jeanette. Uh, Jametta, Jametta, good to see you. Hey, hey Greta. Greta. <laughs> hey, Kenya. Igami, good to see you. Venus, good to see you. Um, hey, Alicia and My Stethoscope Travels and Regional Sky Girl, good to see you. Yeah. Live Spirit VT, Vitae, Vitally? I don't know. I don't know. Yes. We're going to speak truth today. We're going to talk about it. We're going to talk about it. Okay, so let's see. Hey, Latina Yogi, Professor, good to see you again. And my peace, Alice Rising, Krishan, hey, Krishan. So, Vicky, which one were you talking about? I think you were talking about the beer commercial. Or were you talking about the one with the with the cuddly, you know, whatever those things are, that hold babies. I don't know. I, don't, I haven't had babies in so long. I forget what you call that stuff. Baby holders. Baby holders. Okay. <laughs> okay, Greta, you caught it. You caught it. Yeah. It is very subtle. It is very, very subtle. Hey, Phil, it's good to see you. So you caught it immediately. Very good. That's right. Are you in marketing? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, and here's the thing. A lot of these companies don't hire people who look like us. So I'm not going to say that they sat there and thought about what they were going to do. They didn't. The problem is, is they didn't think about it. Right. They didn't think about what they were showing and it didn't even occur to them what their subconscious was coming out and who they chose to play which role in that commercial. So, yep. So a family and a single black mom. That's what we do. That's what yeah. we do. What happened to our slides? I wanted to, let's see, there, there they are. Let me bring those back up. Oh, here it is, add to the stream. I wanna go back. A baby mama versus a family, 
right? Yeah, well, yeah. Why can you... Right? Um, and to add insult to injury, <laughs> this one, <laughs> which is organic, and this one is not organic, but it's cheaper. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if that has anything to do with anything, but I did. You probably can't see on your, depending upon how big your screen is, but the price tag, it is less expensive than the other one, which is hilarious. It's like, okay, well, what are we saying here? What are we doing here? So yeah, you guys caught it. Yeah. What does this do to us? Right. What does this do to us? Um, and so I'm going to read a definition of oppression. So what we deal with in America is abject oppression, abject oppression. And as black women, double it. Because we get it from the gender side and then we get it from the racism side. So oppression is discrimination carried to its extreme. Oppressed people are not only discriminated against, but are also subject to physical and psychological brutality and occasionally genocide. Sometimes for disobeying or displeasing those in power, sometimes to discourage them and others from trying to change their conditions, and sometimes out of pure hatred. So it's funny to me when I hear folks say in the comments, you know, why we talk about what we talk about, the way we talk about what we talk about, and why are we called our Black Utopia, et cetera. If, this, if that definition didn't give you a clue, I'm not sure what to say. So what we're going to talk about today is internalized racism and because that affects all other areas of our lives. It affects the way we buy, the way we save, how we, and how we handle our money in general, right? Mm -hmm. it, it affects how we do in school, or it could affect how we do in school, definitely how we are perceived in the classroom, how we get jobs, how we don't get jobs, how we are perceived, how we are paid, right? Um, it affects the loans that we get or don't get. You know, how many times have we heard people say, you know, how come Black people never take care of their stuff? They never take care of their neighborhoods, right? Or, or if it's someone else, how come you guys don't take care of your neighborhoods? Why do you always tear them up? Um, so for individuals, and when, when we go through this, what I want you to think about is not so much what I am reading is going to be on a scale of one to 10, it's going to be a 10, 10 being the worst. All right. Most of us are not 10s, especially the folks who are watching our show are probably not 10s. Um, I consider myself on the scale of, of being still susceptible and and affected by internalized racism or a colonized mind, I, I consider myself at about a five to six. Well, if you're that way, geez. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I say that to say, instead of looking at what doesn't apply, look at what does apply, even if it's only 10%. OK, so for individuals, pattern of internalized oppression causes us to dramatize our feelings of rage, fear, indignation, frustration and powerlessness at each other. At ourselves, at other black people and often those who are closest to us for our children, we invalidate our children with fierce criticisms mm -hmm. and fault finding, intending to straighten them out, prepare them for the world. World ain't easy. And all of that stuff, you got to be twice as this, twice as that, et cetera. But in the process, we destroy their self-confidence. And then for the group, us as a whole, as a community, patterns of internalized racism cause adults to find fault, criticize, and invalidate each other. The invar this invariably happens when we come together in a group to address some important problem or undertake some liberation project. What follows is divisiveness disunity leading to despair and abandonment of the effort. We see these not only in some liberation thing, but we see it in the church. We see it in parents groups. We see it in our civic organizations where what should be 
a strong, powerful force, whether it be the NAACP, whether it be the Urban League or some of the more local, like I was in charge of Colorado Black Women for Political Action, homegrown, right? So whether it is one of those um, stalwarts of, of our community or a homegrown organization or the fraternities or the sororities, the local chapters or national, we see these patterns. And so what does it look like in our own lives? <laughs> Number one, you're an overachiever. You know, and I never thought, well, before we had the conversation, I never thought I was an overachiever. Uh, I just didn't. Uh, then as we looked into it more and more, yeah, and I started reading the different things, I would be the first one to arrive, the last one to leave, and knowing everybody's job. But how I took it and looked at it was I was making myself more valuable. But were your colleagues doing the same stuff, right? I was also the first one to arrive, the last one to leave. I, and my dad said to me when I was 19 years old, 20 years old, when you get on that job, you learn everybody else's job. And yes, make yourself invaluable. So what, what they say here, and the website that I got some of this stuff from is down below. You're extremely, if you're an overachiever, you're extremely grateful to be given a chance at your work, organization, community group, whatever, and want to prove to everybody and yourself that you deserve to be there and you're terrified of letting people down. You're extremely grateful for the chance to have this job. Now, a lot of us are of a certain age and we've kind of gotten over that, but have we gotten over it 100%? Like I was telling Rick, after I ran for office, like I was through, I was through with the proving yourself and this and that and the other, but that's not necessarily true. It just looked differently. I had a lot more confidence. I knew my self-worth, but I was still proving. I still had a bit of the imposter syndrome and felt the need to prove when I had more credentials than the people, be it through experience, life experience, and education, than the people I was trying to prove it to. All right, so now we're going to ask you, do you see in yourself, on the job, in the community, when you're a part of a volunteer group or not, this feeling that you have to prove that you deserve to be there? Or did you ever? I'm going down to the bottom and I'm going to make my way up because there's a lot in the chat. Yes. And that's where I was December 2021. I was working yeah. 70 hours a week. Um, I volunteer. I, well, I, there wasn't really somebody from leadership had to be at every single community organization. And so it was either going to be my boss or me. And she didn't have a life <laughs> like her life was this whole thing. I was taking care of my dad. Right. And I it was a lot. It was a lot. And I, it was killing me overachiever, trying really hard to survive a crunked up system. Yeah. Yep. Working twice as hard, knowing you are seen um, as less than half as good. And I was telling, I, we were, when we were talking about this, I was telling Rick about when I worked at the venture capital firm and um, they paid for two of us to go to school. One is, was this white girl and um, they paid for her to get her master's degree with with the knowledge, well, she had the knowledge that they were setting her up for a promotion. So once she graduated, they had her on a track to become one of the partners. Then I decided to go to business school and they paid for half of my tuition as well and then laid me off after I graduated. Home chick never finished. We feel we have to outwork everyone to validate being in the room. 
And, and so the question is, is like, how do we exercise ourselves from that? I think the first thing is, is just, is, is recognizing it and recognizing it when you're, when you're doing it and saying, nah, I'm through. And that's one of the reasons for this conversation. Exactly. Hey, Tanisia, um, definitely. Overachievers make too much noise for them. <laughs> so this is my only regret not going to an HBCU. Yes, me too. Me too. Hey, Tanya. They spelled my daughter uh, Janae's name wrong. They put Jane. I told her she could change it. Her response was no. <laughs> so my son's name is Jabari. And he got so much guff for that name. It was at the time when Aladdin, Disney's Aladdin was came, coming out mm -hmm. and Jafar, well, it had already been out and Jafar was the bad guy and they wanted to call him Jafari. And I was like, don't let people call it. I don't know what Jafar means. I don't know what Jafari means. I do know what Jabari means. And so I asked him also if he wanted to change his name and he said no. And I'm glad that he did, didn't. Okay, so Alice Rising says, I'm over it. I'm quietly quitting, mentally and emotionally fatigued. Yeah. You know? I stand a better chance of getting a job with Jane. I can't say she's not right. Recovering overachiever. I love it. I cannot say that she's not right. You know, um, in my previous career, yes, that was the reason I left. I was working and got no reward, None. no reward, you know, and I, you know, I don't know how many times. And, and it's funny because you said, well, oftentimes I was the only black face in the room. Yeah. Most of the time I was. Yeah. Well, that's all. That's all of us. Right. Yeah. That's all of us. And what does that do? What does that say? Because I'm not going to be the magical Negro. Like, oh, well, you're different. I, they never went so far as to say, well, you know, at least he's not really black. They never went so far as to say that. But you're different. But the you're different. And I would tell them, no, I'm typical. I'm a typical black woman. I am not different. I am not more this or less that or anything. I used to feel that big time could have literally died trying to prove myself. I'm a bit better now, but I'm still catch myself. I think we all do. Yeah. I think they all do. We all do. They didn't want to have to pay you more, obviously. You know, they actually did me a favor by laying me off. Um, but that's not the point, right? Just because I made lemonade out of the lemons doesn't mean it wasn't wrong. It was so, so wrong. This, you know, this is what's going on yeah. today. And so if you're watching this and you have kids who are under 18, under 10 in their life, like if you have questions about, oh, I don't want to, you know, upset the, oh, they're doing so well in school. I don't want to this. I don't want to that. Really? Because I think having international experience on their resume will, will overcome the Shaniqua yeah. and the Deshaun. Because yeah. I know folks who have creative names and, but also have international experience on their resume and they're running things if that's what they want to do, right? Um, and and it, it is a big overcomer. And so I would really, I and, and then the self-esteem and the self-confidence that you get from being able to assimilate to different right. cultures is there's there's just nothing that you can do about it. Totally. Nothing you can right. Totally um, agree. So I went to HBCU and I legally changed my name at age 26. It was for me a step in decolonizing my mind. Yes. So I was born, y'all, Lisa. But I've been Halisi since. Um, since kindergarten, I was registered in kindergarten as Halisi. And I asked my dad, I'm like, why didn't you legally change my name? Because my passport right now says Halisi. My license, my driver's license has always said Halisi because I'm so old. 
that this was before PCs and computers. <laughs> so you could just put down, you could put, you came with your little thing from school, your, yeah. your permit from school, right? That you passed the, the class and whatever was on there is what went on your driver's license. So my driver's license has always said Halisi, but my birth certificate, my social security card and all of that said Lisa. I used to be told your name can't be Ricardo. Why? Because I was black and there weren't black Ricardos. I had to be Richard. Oh. And it was like, no, my name is Ricardo. And would teachers say this or just kids? I had teachers say, oh, yeah, your, your name is Richard. It's like, no, it's Ricardo. Well, Ricardo is a, is a Spanish name. You can't have that name. Your name is Ricardo. But we can have an English name. We could have a British name. But yeah. not a Spanish. Richard. That's said, just no, that's, my name is like, Ricardo. Do you see how stupid that is? Like most folks in America have European names, but you can only have European names from some countries and not other countries. That's the goofiest yeah. stuff I've ever heard in my entire life. But it's funny because when I, even since I've been here, and they said because I don't speak uh, Portuguese. Portuguese or anything, they said, "Well, you're Ricardo, so you don't speak." It's like, <laughs> no, I don't. Uh, and I tell them where I got my name from. So <laughs> then he's like, oh, okay. Yeah. Yep. This is why sisters are dying on these jobs. That's right. Yeah. And what we don't want from you, for you guys, seriously. And that's why if, if you, if you need help with your money, please take the course. Um, what we don't want is for you to turn around and then be gone before you have a chance to do it, what it is you want to do. One of my oldest friends, who was just one year older than me, um, was just just transitioned. And I mean, she was 59 years old. I don't think she ever retired. So she worked and worked until she died. Constantly trying to prove my value and worth with little to no reward or recognition. Absolutely. Yeah. I know. I know. I know. I know, you know, um, but it was really interesting to me because when I asked for the money to go to school and um, to go to grad school, I saw the one of the partners and the HR lady give each other a look. And basically, and I was like, I'm not stupid. So so y'all done talked about this and they made it they made it clear that, you know, well, um, only though, you know, in venture capital, you have to go to certain schools. Like, have you guys ever heard of the University of Denver? It's not USC. They think it's USC. Ain't nobody heard of DU. Unless you were from Colorado. So I don't see why that was so such a much. Um, how do you feel as a child, Rick, being told that? I, I argued the fact when I was a kid, I, you know, it was just that argumentative thing. And I knew my mother had my back because she named me. Yes. It may have been after a TV show, <laughs> but she named me. Hey, and, Lucy. <laughs> you know, that's where I got my name from, the Lucille Ball show, because she couldn't think of a name. And and uh, she was watching Lucille Ball. So, yeah, but I, I, I always argued that fact. And when somebody would call me Richard. I would not answer. And I, I, I would, and I would I correct, answer. I correct people because yeah. I, even though Ricardo and Richard mean the same thing, that's not the point. And Halisi means genuine or truth. And so I don't allow people to call me anything different. And, um, you know, my family actually consciously decided not to name like my generation on European names because it just didn't make sense. So my formal first name is Jemaya, and the J is pronounced like an H L Hamaya because it's a Spanish name. Okay. Um, I get weird looks when I tell folks my mom's from Panama. That's because in America, we do not educate. We do not educate properly. I had an old white man ask me if my surname was my husband's name. Uh, no, sir, never been married. <laughs> oh, because you couldn't be a McCullough? You couldn't be a McCullough. I tell people, look, when people ask what kind of name is Vincent, I said, look, Master Vincent. <laughs> Master Vincent was from Scotland. 
So lots of my former colleagues in TV changed their names to be American friendly. Yep, 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 yep. Imagine having Negra as your name and having to explain it through the years. Oh, God, I'd hate to have to do that. It's, it's, it's so crazy. It's so unfair. You know? Yeah. And you know where people want to go. You, we know where people want to go. All the time. We know where people want to go. See, and I'd be fighting. I'd have grew up just fighting all the time. <laughs> I'd probably be under somebody's prison because I'd mean to beat somebody. It's just ridiculous. You got some explaining to do. You know? <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, overachiever. Number two. You're worried about fulfilling a stereotype. We talked about this. I'm going to read what, what it says, and then we will talk about okay, the stereotype. I, I was reading Rick's his, his, his A page. Okay. Yeah. All right. So you're worried about f fulfilling a stereotype. You're conscious of the stereotypical behaviors associated with your racial identity and try to avoid them at all costs, for example. If you are a black woman, you overcompensate the angry black woman stereotype by being extra soft, polite, and people pleasing. So, um, I for me, I did not want to be a single mom and marry somebody I had no business marrying because I did not want to fall into that statistic. And and so did what you know? Was that a good look? No. No, because homeboy was crazy. <laughs> yeah. Rick's not my first husband. Uh, I guess you guys pretty much got that, but 20 years. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so not the first, but the best. So oh, thank you, sweetie. you're welcome, sweetheart. So what what stereotypes? My stereotype, and I've carried this since I was a little kid. You couldn't give me a Cadillac. I never wanted to buy a Cadillac. I would never buy a Cadillac. And I know Cadillacs are good cars. But because of what I heard growing up is all black people want to do is eat chicken and buy a Cadillac. That's all we want. And from that moment on, I mean, I beat the kid up who, who kept saying that. But, you know, <laughs> I like chicken. I'm not giving up chicken. Yeah, I do like chicken. Hey. But I would never buy a Cadillac. And people used to always say, well, why, why not? They're good cars. It's but like, because of that. He would buy a car made by a country that also persecuted us along with the Jews and everybody else. See, we don't, we don't even, we don't even dissect when we come up with this stuff. It is so insidious that it stops us from thinking critically. Yeah. Right? It does. So we'd rather have a car made by Germans who persecuted us than American made where probably uncle was working in the factory and getting paid union wages at the time, right? One of them good jobs. One of them good jobs, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, I mean, whoever makes a car, they've oppressed us. Yeah. But I wasn't getting no Cadillac. <laughs> His name was Jamie. And my Little thing, boy, and I beat him down because uh, my thing, my thing was food stamps and being on the county. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, n no one in my family was necessarily in my immediate family was necessarily ever on taking aid. I ended up taking food stamps, and was ashamed of it. Now I'm like, my tax dollars pay for this. So I'm taking, I'm getting whatever help I can get. I don't have any problem with it today. But when I was younger, that was one of my issues. And I know that had to do with not wanting to be the, um, the welfare. Queen. I was going to say, you wasn't like Ronald Reagan said, you wasn't the so welfare. So I queen. started becoming politically aware yeah. when Ronald Reagan was in office. I was in college, right? And um, and he started with the welfare queen and that trickled down into Clinton and the 90s and all of that stuff. And it's just baloney. So were you ever worried about fulfilling a stereotype and then changed the way you behaved, uh, what you consumed, et cetera, so that you would not fit into their stereotype of us? 
Okay, let's keep going. I got mine from my father who ran away from home at 15 and worked with Mexicans in the fields and he named me after his best friend. <laughs> yeah, right? You, you Look, names are names. I was named after Dick Tracy. Oh, that's funny. Who was a cartoon character? See, no, I don't feel bad. <laughs> Okay, Tony, I came to the U.S. in my 30s, having lived in Europe for three years. When interviewing for jobs and having to discuss my time in Europe, I got a lot of negative energy, especially from, from I guess, white folks, white women. Interesting. Interesting. Mm. Tell us more about that. Because the person that I know um, that I'm thinking of specifically who spent eight years in Japan, she works in nonprofit. And uh, they just tout that like, because she's a different type of Negro. Different type. Okay, I'm going to go down to the end, y'all, and make my way back up. In Detroit, first thought, Cadillac was pimp. So you also talked about the clothes you would or would not wear. Speaking of pimp. I'm a conservative dresser. And we kind of went back and... Did we I kind of went back and forth. No, you thought it out loud, though. I'm conservative. I've always been a conservative dresser. I like penny loafers. I just do. What? <laughs> Think about all the time and life's energy worrying about someone else's opinion we could have spent on time working out our own stuff. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But you saw with, with that commercial, for instance, H had you watched that, under a different context, not under the context of what we're talking about today. Would you have caught that? Would you have caught that subtlety? Rick didn't catch it at first. No. Right? And and I am so, at, like, I, I tell people all the time, I was raised by uh, Sister Soja and Malcolm X. Not Martin Luther King, Malcolm X. That was my mom and daddy. And, um, and so I've always been hyper aware and still, and still I suffer from these isms. My stepdad had a Cadillac and was top number, top number runner. We were looked up to by the entire neighborhood. My mama had a Cadillac. She kept that Cadillac Seville forever. Cadillacs are good cars. They I are just, good cars. I just had that stigmatism in my head, you know. But the two things I wasn't giving up, I wasn't giving up watermelon and I wasn't giving up chicken. I'm a, I'm a. <laughs> because of my moniker, I want to make clear I'm African-American and Puerto Rican. Sometimes the freedom from racism is to buy and do what we want and not think about it all the time. German cars are well-made, truly, truly. They are truly well-made cars. Right? Um, and, and, and as well as Cadillacs, right? I never got one. I mean, you know, I, I liked them. I aspired to get a Mercedes, but... I never bought it. I, I got let, out of it. I wouldn't let him. <laughs> I wouldn't let him. I'm like, we ain't spending all that money on that. We ain't doing it. Um, and the, and and what's interesting, Latina Yogi, is is how many people don't realize it because we don't have a good education system that there are black folks in Puerto Rico, that there are black folks in Cuba, there are black Latinas, and so many don't realize that. Um, my mom always told me not to wear your color out in the streets. You better not let them good white folks see you doing such and so and so. Now, my mom never said that, but my grandparents. Well, yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of things you heard. From Make sure you got some clean underwear on just yeah. in case you get into an accident. You clean, want... clean drawers. <laughs> the number one thing. I don't wear drawers. I wear underwear. When your grandmama's from deep, deep down south, this is go down yonder and fetch me. And make sure you got some clean drawers on when you're fetching me something from down yonder. <laughs> down yonder. George says the name doesn't have a translation. If you call Ricardo, you are Ricardo like my cousin. In my case, it's different. My name is George, but you say it George in English. Yes. Yeah, so in English, there is no difference. Right. But R here they say Ricardo. Ricardo. Right, they barely, right, George. They because barely it's, pronounce the O. Yeah, um, but it still means like lion-hearted or something like that. That's Richard. It's yeah. Well, Ricardo is a derivative of that. Yeah. I'm sorry, baby. <laughs> I looked it up. 
I I looked at I know. I just like to just leave it at Ricardo. There's no Interesting, way. Greta. So you would never buy a Ford. Henry Ford was a racist. They were all racist. They were all racist. Um, try not to talk ignorant. Would not speak black in front of white folks. No, I I would. And, you know, you might look at me and say, well, what do you mean not speaking in black? And, and, and what I was trying to explain to her is when you get with brothers and you're talking, you know, you're talking to talk, you're talking a little slang and stuff like that. And you, But you understand each other. Just like when you see a brother walking down the street, you go, nothing has to be said. Nothing has to be said. But you have to explain that to somebody that does not understand that diaspora move. And it's like. Well, anyone who's not American. You know, and it's like you're just greeting somebody. You, but that greets, greeting says a whole lot. And I don't want to have to explain it to people. So True. But do we change the way we speak in front of folks now? There's two ways to look at this, and I think it, we might talk about it um, uh, at a later point, but I'm just going to bring it up now and then we can repeat it. If you're doing it tactically, playing the game, code switching to play the game, that's one thing. But if it's not a tactical move, a strategic move, but you really do not feel comfortable speaking the way your parents speak, you know, with that accent, that's a different story. If it's coming out of a place of, in the back of your mind, it's less intelligent. In the back of your mind, it's not professional. That's a different story. The whole notion of trash talking, which which our community is, that comes out of internalized racism and oppression. And so my daddy used to always say that the oppressed imitate the oppressors. The oppressed imitate the oppressors. And he's right. We are our worst enemies, our own worst enemies. All right, let's see what else you guys are talking about. We had a Cadillac Eldorado when I was growing up. Hated that ugly thing. <laughs> I thought people would think my dad was a pimp. See? Hey, give me a deuce and a quarter. See? <laughs> Give me a nice Buick. <laughs> That's what my uncle drove. Buicks, but they call them Buicks. This, see, this is this is what America does, Isan. I've heard I've heard that Ukrainian immigrants are being given, given social security as soon as they get here. I don't I don't you sometimes we hear stuff in our community and it, and it's not necessarily true but one thing that I do know that I know is true especially coming from the nonprofit world is that there were a lot of loans business loans and home loans that were not available for African Americans but they were only available for immigrants mm -hmm. these nonprofits got money specifically to help immigrants and it would make me so angry not that I thought immigrants shouldn't get any, but why are we being left out? Like there's poor, like take care of the Americans first. You've got poor Americans and the notion that we are just lazy because we, we're asking for money for our labor now. And we've had all of these opportunities. And so there's no excuse is baloney. We all know that, mm -hmm. but they do this if this is true. They do this to make sure that they can divide and conquer. The power structure does not want working class folks to get together in an uprising. They don't want us to stick together, which is why they always, always, always find some way to keep us divided. Okay, let's see what you guys are talking about here. show. I was and still am very cognizant of my speech. I am in a very white state. I went to school in Utah for a year, you guys. When I got back to LA, all my friends said, I talk white. I talk, I, well, Colorado. 
And when I went back to California to visit family and friends, it's like I sound like the dad on the Brady Bunch. <laughs> like, what are you talking about? I'm the only one named by my dad. He named me after a prostitute he met in Paris when he was a soldier. Renee. I like the name Renee. So I mean, rebirth, happy to have it. That's so funny. Um, I guess he like. <laughs> I guess he liked the prostitute, or did he just like the name Renee? I used to hate dress down day at work because I still had to dress professional. No leggings or ripped jeans for me. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Um, we just don't have that luxury. I remember when my son uh, spent freshman year of college in LA um, and he was living with my dad and my mom lived around the corner and he was trying to find a job. He had dreadlocks and my mom was convinced that he needed to cut those dreadlocks off because they did not look professional. Yeah. When I was younger, I was ashamed that my parents weren't married. I used to say my parents were divorced or my father was deceased. See, these are the things. And so how did that affect your self-esteem? Are you is are there still vestiges of that? Right. We're going to get to the healing part. Um, I've got two more to go. We're going to get to the healing part, but you can't heal what you're not aware of. Right. Right. What about the Spanish channels? Uh, Mi familia Latina. I stopped watching because they objectify our women and, and based on our shade, we are the servants. Wow. I, I don't watch a lot of telenovelas. I'm assuming that's what you mean. I play, it plays on your psyche. Oh, it yeah. does. It does. I mean, and I'm old enough. I remember Julia. She was a nurse. Um, so that one, you know, from what I remember was okay. But by and large, we were the maids, right? We were the prostitutes. We were this, we were that. I was not allowed to watch black exploitation back in the day. Um, Oh yeah, so there so there were a lot of us that went to Russia um, in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, which is why um, the Black Panthers were pseudo uh, communists, um, and they thought that a lot of of the Black civil rights organizations were communists. Um, what are the stereotypes that Portuguese have for Americans? I don't know. That's a good question. I have no idea. I do know, like I was talking to this man today in the elevator, um, and he said we were, this homeless guy had a sandwich maker, and he had gotten like a TV dinner still in the tinfoil thingy, and he had the, the tinfoil thing in between the sandwich maker. It was like a, you know, the kind that you'd make like a grilled cheese, right. that kind of sandwich like maker. Like a panini. Uh, like a panini, right. And he was warming that thing up plugged into the hallway in the parking lot. <laughs> I said ingenuity. And so the Portuguese, the other guy, he was speaking to me in Portuguese. And um, I, you know, I said, look, I, I told him in Portuguese, I don't understand. I said, I'm just learning Portuguese. Um, and then he said, asked me, at first he said, I said, I, I'm just learning Portuguese. I know I said it right. And he said, are you Brazilian? I was like, I said, no. In Portuguese, I said, no, if I was Brazilian, I'd speak Portuguese. Um, so I said, Estados Unidos. He said, oh, you know, and he wasn't happy or sad based on Brazilian or, Port or uh, United States. No reaction. Um, now, the, the guy at our little mini Mercado, he thought I was English from England. And then when I told him American, he's, he, he, he seemed happy. So I don't know. Um, I don't know. And well, and how they George is in it. George, yeah. Are there any stereotypes about Americans? And here's the thing: like, do they make a do they do they have a different picture in their mind between Black Americans and White Americans and other Americans? Um, you know. Feel free to answer that, George. Yeah, my children would have the same father. I had my tubes at, tied after divorcing. One of my biggest regrets. 
These are the things that we do because we don't want to fall into a stereotype. I hesitate to tell people I'm an accountant because they instantly elevate my status. I don't appreciate the false heightened status. I don't want, right, that to be a barometer of my worth. Different type of Negro, Shana. Yeah. You're not like, you're not like those not other like, ones. Yeah, you're not like them. Tanya, I'm a shop steward and my approach is different. And one of the deputies kept saying, you're so articulate. There you go. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Just like Biden said that Obama was so articulate. And then we wonder why things are happening the way they are. But I ain't going to get into that. I'm not going to get into that. Uh, my mom said, if you work hard, you will earn people's respect. Man, I don't think she got out of that house much. No. No. I mean, so you will earn some people's respect, but you will never get the respect of folks who are of the majority right. ever, ever, ever. I, you know, I remember when I was at the venture capital firm, I was talking to one of my bosses about something. I can't remember exactly what we were talking about, which leads me into one of the next ones. Now, number four. So I'll wait to tell that story until we get to number four. So number three. So number one was you're an overachiever. You're just so proud to have this job and you make sure that you do so much that you let everybody know that you deserve to be there and you're terrified of letting people down. Number two, you're worried about fulfilling stereotypes. Number three, you suppress aspects of your racialization. Now we've kind of been talking about that and how they put it is you're self-conscious about the ways you might appear too ethnic. For example, you may dislike your accent and attempt to code switch and train your speech to be more white in hopes of sounding more intelligent or and civilized. 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 Yeah. This isn't the same thing as tactically code switching in order to avoid racial hostility or to attract better service, support, jobs, etc. Internalized oppression requires a belief that your racialization makes you less professional, approachable, and likable. Tactical assimilation comes instead from a place of self-love and self-acceptance, yet knowing when you need to play the game to make life easier, okay? So you suppress aspects of your racialization. Um, I know that in college, I did that. I know I did. And, and it was a conscious thing. Now, I don't, I was not, see, when you grow up with Sister Soldier and Malcolm X, you know better. So I remember, I'm, a, I'm telling all the dirty secrets, y'all. I remember when I was in third grade, fourth grade, I think fourth grade, and now I knew better. I knew better. But let's listen, listen to what I said. So it was getting close to summertime or maybe it was summertime. I can't remember. And I had just come from the pool and I say, yeah. And whatever his name is, I'm gonna call him Bob. And Bob was out there and, you know, trying to get a suntan like he's black enough. What did I say that for? And my father said, oh, yeah. I said, yeah, you know, you don't need to be out in the sun. And he said, so, Halisi, what is black enough? Um, well, you know, no, I don't know. Tell me, what is black enough? And of course, I didn't have an answer. Um, so I knew better. Consciously, I knew better. Mm -hmm. But it is so insidious. And I just repeated what some of the other kids were saying because colorism is alive and well, right? It was alive and well back in the 70s and 80s. It's alive and well today. Um, so I was just repeating, even though I knew better. So when it comes to being self-conscious or talking more white um, in college, I know I did that. Now, did I do it because I thought that speaking Ebonics <laughs> or having a Southern accent or any of that stuff sounded less intelligent or civilized, I would not consciously admit that to myself because I knew better. But I also knew that I was consciously making a decision to assimilate and not necessarily because of tactics, because I wasn't that smart yet. I just wasn't, not at no. 19, 18, 19, 20 years old. Well, we have a friend that kind of stop or stifles herself uh, in making her business grow because she's afraid of 
people won't understand what she's saying because of her accent. Yeah. Yeah. A friend of mine um, has a Southern accent and it's interesting because we were also talking about what's homeboy's name, Trayvon Martin's uh, Oh, the lawyer for Trayvon Martin. Yeah, it starts with a C. Oh, God. I see his face and I can't remember. Yeah. Y'all know who we're talking about. And he has a very thick accent. And Crump. Ben Crump. Is it Crump? Yes, Ben Crump. Okay. And I remember uh, a family friend saying, saying some things about the way he was talking, right? I think he said ax. I asked them what the problem was and blah, 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 whoop-de-whoop. Well, now we know that he is- He's brilliant. Yes, very smart, yeah. very accomplished, et cetera. Um, and, and, and I asked that person, I said, now, if you were white with that same accent, would you say the same thing or would you just say, oh, he's from the deep South and leave it alone? So why, when the accent comes in a brown package, uh, is he all of a sudden not intelligent enough to be up, up in front of these cameras? Right. Yes, my family said that too. Always buy American cars so that Black folks have a job. Yep. Yep. See, now code switching is different than what we're talking about because it's it's the motive behind the code switching. Are you code switching to make your life easier or are you code switching because you think to sound like your grandmother, even if your grandmother spoke good English but had an accent, is less professional? That's the thing. That's the question, right? Um, so I'm going to scroll down to the end because it, you guys are talking a lot. So let me see what we're saying here. Um, I love the Southern accent. It sounds like melted butter. It does. <laughs> yes. And so that friend of ours, um, I said, girl, she, she used to have, um, if you're watching this, you're going to know I'm talking about you, a boutique. She might still have a boutique. Um, and the way she would put stuff together, she was just she was always amazing. runway <laughs> ready, whether it was jeans runway weather or, or, or formal runway ready. Yes. Um, she just knew how to put things together. And so I was like, you need a YouTube channel. And oh, girl, I can't do YouTube, you know, with this accent, the way I talk, you know, no one will want to watch me and da, 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 da. So I showed her one of the ladies that I watch, who's also a stylist, um, who's of a certain age, looks like us, and has that same exact accent. As a matter of fact, had I heard her off camera, I would have thought it was my friend. And I showed it to her. I said, see, look how many she had, like, you know, hundreds of thousands of followers. I'm like, don't sell yourself short. Hey, Greta, good to see you. Um, there are, okay, let's see what you guys are t There are a number of single white baby moms, but our single moms are just magnified. Oh, yeah. My mom was the original OG baby mama. <laughs> and she took very good care of me. That's right. That's right. You know, um, I, there is a reason why they vilify and lessen when we do the same things that they do, right? Like everybody, er, Americans get divorced of all stripes and shades, right? But when we do, it's the breakdown of the black family or black on black crime, or where are those black leaders? How many times have we watched the news waiting for them to show a picture of the culprit? And what do we say? I hope he ain't black. I'm guilty of it. I, ain't, I ain't. hope he's not black. Hope he's not black. Hope he's not. Oh, please, please don't be black. Please. Oh, he's black. Oh, please, don't be black. why is it? But if he's not black, you like I. I told Rick. I said no one's ever come up to me and said, "Well, so did you know so and so who was in the news?" Right? Did you know so and so? No, no one's ever come up to me and say that. Said that. So why are we? so emotionally invested to make sure that the person that they're showing on screen is not black. Why? Because we don't want it to shine a bad light on us. And how does what somebody else do shine a bad light on you? It doesn't. It's all in here. Why is it that one person from our, who looks like us, right, is representative of the whole? 
But when these kids, where is it? When these kids are out in the streets doing this mischief and uh, what booze filled reveling and being rowdy, they don't say, where are the white leaders? They don't say, you know, um, you know, what's wrong with the white community? Right. Why aren't why aren't they doing such and so and so? Um, exactly. Southern does not mean not smart. Exactly. 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 Uh, Brother man is brilliant. So the fact that one person's actions out there represents our whole community is part of the racism, colonization, the oppression that happens in America because one person defines the whole, but one person from their community does not define the whole. After January 6, no one was saying, no one was targeting young white men as terrorists. No one was pulling over arbitrary, like after, uh, after the first time when they were when they were marching on what was it South Carolina North Carolina with the tiki torches South Carolina so and they had and they had button down shirts and and penny and your penny loafers on and all of that and you know chanting that nonsense that they were chanting oh, no I don't like penny loafers good <laughs> <laughs> and they were chanting that nonsense they were chanting Jews no, will not replace us. yeah I, I rebuke that in the name of Jesus when chanting that nonsense. I didn't even want to say it on YouTube, right? They were not targeting young white men who wore button down, pink button down shirts yeah. and khakis, right? And going in the store buying tiki torches. Like cops weren't hanging out at Walmart looking to see who was coming out with a tiki torch saying, you know, possible terrorists, let's follow them around and see what they're doing. No. But no. any brown person whose name happens to be, you know, Arabic, gets targeted. Any black person driving, walking, being, living, gets brushed with that wide swath from the one to two or three percent of our community that's up to no good. And this is so daunting. It, it just... It's tiring. It's tiring. It, it just puts a weight on us and it affects everything that we do. Everything. everything. We do. The consumerism, buying stuff either so that we can show we've come up, I'm a different type of Negro, treat me differently, to the respectability politics. I remember seeing this, uh, I think it was YouTube, on YouTube. It was a Karen incident and this Karen had blocked in this lady, um, blocked her car in. She was doing, the lady was doing Uber Eats, black lady was doing Uber Eats or something like that. She was delivering, actually delivering. And she comes back to her car and Home Chick had blocked her in because she doesn't belong there. Don't she belong here. Not that she was parked in Home Chick's parking space, right? No, not that. But what are you doing in this neighborhood type of situation, right? Blocked her in and called the police. And the black lady said, I have a master's degree in engineering and I'm doing this to make extra money to do blah, blah, blah. And you have to try to justify herself. So if, yeah, talking about her credentials. So what she was saying with that is anyone who doesn't have a master's degree deserves to be oppressed but because she has a master's degree, she should be treated special. And how much do we do to get acceptance from the majority? My God, the articulate thing. Yep, mm -hmm. we go to the same schools with the same teachers teaching the same lesson. It always seems to be a shock, right? <laughs> to white people <laughs> that we can speak well and learn, and learn things. Yes. <laughs> white people. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I do it, W-Y-P-I-P-O. Actually, it was a white friend who taught me that. Levi. Levi, yeah. yeah. That seems like something he would do. Yep. Good for you. I stopped doing it too. I stopped doing it too. I was like, these people, look, I'm, I, I am more experienced than anybody else in the room. Shut up and sit down. 
That, that was my attitude the last two years. When I hear a non-Black person with a heavy Southern accent, I hear banjos playing like Mississippi burning pops into my mind. Oh my gosh, Tabitha Brown had the same problem trying to change herself to act in Hollywood. Is that what happened? I, you know, I did not know she had ever gotten any kind of Hollywood contracts until I guess the fit had hit the sham and it went down, it went south. And then I started hearing things about it. Um, I feel like there is a difference between Southern accent and bad grammar. Um, yeah. Yeah. All right. Tabitha Brown talked about how she held back her Southern accent. See, that's not good. Had a customer call in demanding a refund on items she opened and was keeping. When told she would not get a refund uh, on the stuff, she said that if she were black, she would get those items for free. Yeah, like where are all these cell phones and stuff that Obama was giving out? Like, right? He was giving us all cell phones and stuff. Did you ever get one? I was supposed to get a cell phone? That's what they say. Oh, that ain't right. That's what they say, Mrs. Rogers' Neighborhood. It's a beautiful day in this neighborhood. When I speak, I have a neutral sound. I actually teach English to foreigners, and they think I'm white because of the stereotype about thinking that Black people only speak Ebonics. We have two tree languages, man. We speak Ebonics. We speak the Queen's English. We feel we represent all Blacks. Right. And we don't. We don't get to be individuals. No. I was complimented by the Portuguese taxi driver for my accent. I'm an American black woman from the Midwest. Yeah. You know, and I think Californians, too, are kind of like uh, accent neutral. I do phone ESL lessons. Oh, so that's how they don't know. You don't do it via uh, video. Oh. Okay, we fear repercussions from each other's behavior. It's it's very much vestiges of the plantation culture. It is. It is fruit of the slavery tree, y'all. It really, really, really is. When the DC sniper was black, we were in shock, right? Because yeah. we're not serial killers. <laughs> that's the cray cray stuff. That's them. We ain't cray cray. It's about money, food. You know, you don't slept with my woman. Respect. Yeah, just picking people off at gas stations. That was, that that's was not our thing. Real trippy. Yeah. Like, I don't know, are we starting to get into the privilege class now? When we can just be cray cray. No. <laughs> well, no, I know. Well, just look at the revolt on the White House. If we, if we did that, it would have been civil war. It would have been crazy. And that was it, y'all. January 6th was it for me. It was it. I was like... This country treats us like an abusive husband treats his wife. That's how America treats black folks. And y'all, it is time to go. Get your money straight, get your health straight, and let's go. Start let's detoxing. go. You know, and I'm not saying it's perfect in other places. Um, but I tell you one thing. When you only understand A1 or A2 level of the language, it, it don't really matter what they're saying. Like, I'll take an eye roll over a gunshot any day. Any day. I work for a large global tech company. Yep, I code switch to survive corporate America and my ignorant coworkers. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Put on a face to meet the faces that you meet. We get that. Play the game, right? As long as we know we're playing the game. You two people can gather and get drunk. Or, or, oh, not YouTube. <laughs> and get drunk and rowdy on St. Patrick's Day. Let me tell you, Krishan. So I was doing a parade with our congresswoman in Denver. Uh, CD1, Congressional District 1 in Denver. Marching along with her in the St. Patty's Day parade. Those folks from the majority group threw beer bottles at her, called her a baby killer, a B-I-T-C-H, and everything else, and nothing happened to them, to a congresswoman. Yeah. 
This is this is this is the double standard. I mean, where are we when you are throwing beer bottles at women? Where are we when you're throwing beer bottles at your elected official? <laughs> George. George. Sorry, but for me, that's crazy. I think the USA has so many problems that is good only for the politicians. It's not even good for them. They, they, truth be told. Yeah. And it's not getting any better. It's only good for wealthy, heterosexual white males and then white females. But after that, this is the whole premise of black excellence, how close you are to symbols of white wealth, whether by title, residence, possessions, means of success, yes. And that to me is the problem with black excellence. This notion that we all have to be Claire and whatever his name was, Huxtable, right? Cliff, Cliff and Claire. You know, if we're not doctors and lawyers and things like that, then we're nothing is nonsense. It's nonsense. And then if we're not that, then buying all of the trappings to live up to that so that we are slaves to our debt and we are stuck in a in a situation that we cannot get out of. Y'all, debt is, is just as much of a killer. We've got to get out of it so we can get out of Dodge. I got profiled in the lobby of my own condominium community. I've lived here longer than most of these people. See, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> I haven't, worn, well, I have a pair of hard sole shoes, but because of the cobblestone and stuff, I pretty much try to stay with soft shoes. Yeah, you don't want to wear those slippery shoes here. I had a Karen experience. Woman started moving my groceries out of my cart to get the attention of the clerk because she thought I stole half of the eaten food I bought in Whole Foods. Hmm. What is it with some people believing that they are an extension of the police force and that we need policing? I have to say, we've only been here for six and a half months. I have never felt like Portuguese people feel the need to police me. I have not felt that. Hmm. The one time I did see a guard following me around here in Portugal, he was African. See, we're going to get to how we deal with each other in the community. We're going to get to that. We're going to get to that. I've never experienced a Karen or Ken yet. Can't wait. I haven't either. Um, but then I walk in such a way, I carry myself in such a way that it's like, especially when I lived in Colorado, it, when you have, I, I'm not bragging because I didn't get paid, but there is a certain amount of confidence when you can call the governor or the mayor and you've got their cell phone numbers. And I'll, I call their names in a minute, in a minute. I mean, I've had plenty of police interactions with guns pulled on me. And I know. I've had plenty of those. And, you know, it was, <laughs> I didn't do anything wrong, but be black. And so did Jabari. Yeah. And, right? I mean, and that's, you know, just knowing that you might not make it home. It's, it's scary. It's very scary. I, I was there. So... Jabari had two incidents. Of course, he got tear gas during the um, during the demonstrations. But then he was on his bicycle coming home from work and a police car. So he's on. Well, probably shouldn't have been riding on the sidewalk, but the police car, excuse me, came right in front of him into a gas station driveway and blocked his way. And, um, and Jabari kind of went like this on his bike and the police get out and Jabari's like, what? And he goes to pick up his backpack and backpack and the guy has his hand on the gun. Hold it, hold it, hold it. Right there, right there, right there. And of course it was like, you look like somebody. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now our youngest son is five, five on a good day. 
and 140 pounds on a good day. So there is no way on God's green earth that any cop could ever say that he felt threatened. Like he's Kevin Hart's size. Well, he might be a little taller than Kevin Hart and Prince, but bear. <laughs> what about the impact that it's had on the way we interact with each other? We're going to get to that, Peyton. We're going to get to that. We are going to get to that. Hey, glass half full. Looking at those pictures reminds me of how King Kong and Tarzan are two of the most racist stories created. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. Yet they are consistently being remade, remade, remade as masterpieces. Absolutely. Yeah, I go to the if I go to Tarzan movies to hope that the lion or the alligators eat Tarzan. <laughs> I have had the experience of black women uh, to suddenly start talking loudly to me so that they could make sure a white person walking by would know what we were talking about. That you weren't talking about them or something? I'm not sure I follow. You have to be on Medicaid to get Obama. Oh, no. oh, it was no, it wasn't a real thing, really? was it? So, because they expanded Medicaid, and so you could make up to forty or fifty thousand dollars and still get Medicaid in some in some uh, states. So then, why would you be like? I could understand if you qualified for Medicaid before the expansion, because that means you really are at poverty level. Um. That right there, Halisi, we are not permitted to be our true authentic uh, individual selves in this country. No, we're not. From NOLA, the Deep South, and I get this all the time. You from here? <laughs> <laughs> of course you're from no New Orleans. Let's go. No. Let's go, bruh. Let's go. Sadly, I had Black people tell me I talk white. I asked the person, what does that even mean? I know. I know. Yeah, I got it, Professor. I got it. All right. Like someone said earlier, some books, some, same lessons. Same book, same lessons. I speak appropriate for the appropriate situation. Exactly. Yeah. But remember who trained the DC sniper? The military. No disrespect, but I mean, yeah. I mean, the military is a killing machine. That's what they that's what they're for, to kill people. Right? To kill people. So, all right, last one. I remember as a teenager, I worked in a department store. My coworkers were adult men and women who were salespeople raising their families on those wages. No one judged them. It was honest work. Yeah, back in the day, back in the day, you know, but anything. And I remember when I was part of, um, I was part of this nonprofit organization and we would come together with other nonprofits. And the whole goal was, um, economic democracy. And how we explain that is democratizing capitalism. Capitalism. So like, um, what, what's the name of my favorite yogurt company? I can't think of it right now. Chobani. Chobani yogurt is partially employee owned. That's the democracy democratization of capitalism. And so we were thinking of this marketing campaign so we could get the word out about employee ownership. Now in Colorado, employee ownership is a big thing. I worked with the governor to make that happen. And so they're, they've got a lot of money going behind it. But at the time we were in Washington, DC and they were thinking of these campaigns and they wanted all these people of color to be on there. And I was like, uh-uh. And they're like, what? I said, if we show, if, if we let them know that we want employee ownership to get special treatment, then there will be all of these people, you know, special treatment in, in the tax code or this, this, that, and the other. And the ads that we show have people that look like us. It, it, it's going to fail. It's going to fail. And they looked at us. They looked at me like I was crazy. I said, look at what happened with welfare with a two dependent families. As soon as they started putting black faces on the ads, support for that went away. When that aid was going to people of the Dust Bowl and in the 40s and 50s and 60s, it was going to people who did not look like us because we didn't have the proper documentation to apply. Everyone supported aid to dependent families, food stamps and social security. Mm -hmm. The moment people like us started getting 
access to that social safety net, all of a sudden it's wasteful, it's giveaways, it's all of this stuff. And so that's, you know, that's the sad reality of it, right? That is the sad reality. All right. So number one, you're an overachiever. Number two, you're worried about fulfilling stereotypes. Number three, you suppress aspects of your racialization. Number four, you're uncomfortable talking about race and racism. I was never really that uncomfortable talking about race or racism. And I, I was going to say at the venture capital firm that I was working at, we were talking about something and my boss I, I was, I don't know, I can't remember exactly what we were talking about, but I said, look, for black folks, it's different. We do not get the same access to, to capital. We don't get the same access to opportunities. And the receptionist, not that there's anything wrong with being a receptionist, however, turned around and we were kind of talking in the vestibule, right? So she turned around and said, well, that's because black people are lazy. She said that to me. I, I didn't like, I treated her like she was a little kid. I was like, oh, sweetheart, that's not true. And then I just kept talking to my boss. Like, I, you are not even worthy of getting more of an explanation. You're not smart enough. You're not bright enough. You're not as much of a critical thinker for me to even waste my breath trying to explain to you what's wrong with that. And I know that you like me, supposedly, and I'm a different type of Negro in her mind but I'm not. And that just shows the people, even with the people who, who think that they're allies, even, <laughs> even with the people who think that they're allies. I remember walking down the street with someone who was in the fight with me and we were on the sidewalk and that person would not move out of the way for a black mom and her child. Just expected her to walk around, even though you know, you know how it goes. If you're going this way, you're on this side of the sidewalk. If you're coming this way, you're on that side of the sidewalk, just like the street. That's how it goes. Those are the unspoken rules. And so she, she needed to get behind me or get in front of me so that the mom could come the opposite direction. But no, she expected this person to go into the street or something. Typical. Typical. So um, <clears throat> no, not uncomfortable about talking about race or racism. You're worried about coming off as a troublemaker by raising political issues. You think you'll ruin everybody's fun by bring up, bringing up negative topics. Is that you? Even just a little bit. Now, obviously, at work, it can mean losing your job. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's a different story. But in social situations the, with, with people who have nothing to do with your paycheck, but even at the job, I would I'd talk about it. I remember when I was working in the entertainment industry and I brought them a film that um, Will Smith, before he went crazy, uh, was attached to. This was in the days of uh, ID4 with Independence Day and all of that stuff. And they said to me, oh, Halisi, we already have a black movie. I said, it's Will Smith. This is not a black movie. It's Will Smith. But they didn't get it. Or they would turn to me and, do you think black people would like such and such and so and so? Like I had to speak for the whole group. Yeah. So no, I've never been uncomfortable speaking about race or racism. What about you? No, uh -uh. I never, never felt uncomfortable talking about it. I will talk about it. And if somebody says something wrong about it, I will be the first one to speak up and say, no, that's a lie. Yeah. 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 And it won't hold my tongue. And I don't care who it is. The last one, you're embarrassed, uncomfortable by your culture and community. Embarrassed. So you think your culture is less refined, less elegant, less tasteful than white European cultures. You think people from your own racial or ethnic group are less cultured, less sophisticated, and less beautiful than white folks. You think the most beautiful people of your race or ethnicity are those most that most resemble white European beauty ideals. Fair skin, narrow noses, light eyes, you know, you know. And we know that this is true because how many skin whitening products are being sold in Africa? 
we ain't even going to talk about the skin whitening products that are in everything in most of the Asian countries. Um, and then number six, you long for white approval and acceptance. You yearn for powerful white people to tell you that you're good and worthy. You seek primarily white friendships and partnerships and mentors and advocates, etc. Now, with five and six, you know, what we're talking about is the extreme. But it are there little pieces of that? Like if, like I said before, if, you know, only thinking, you know, uh, European features are beautiful, if that's a 10, are you at a three or a two, right? Um, for, for approval, are you the one that says, well, I have a master's degree, you know, and I have this and I have that. So why are you treating me this way? Like, like the lady, right? That's to me what it looks like when you know better, but you are still being abused right by the system yeah. and not working on the internalized racism that exists in all of us. And so I wanted to give an example of what it looks like in group efforts. Um, for group effort, patterns of internalized racism cause us adults, I, I read this already, uh, to find fault, criticize, and invalidate each other. This invariably happens when we come together in a group to address some important problem. We have all heard, and in leadership, we hold our leaders to higher standards. We expect them to work miracles, which usually leads to burnout. Um, and so I, I think as a group, like playing the dozens is part of internalized racism. Um, how about that's why I, that's why I don't do no business with black folks. That's why I never that's why I never want to go to these black businesses because they don't X, Y, Z. Yeah, I hate to hear that. Right. We hear that all the time. Um, what I used to hear in the community organizations that I worked with is that we would always compare ourselves. Oh, I wouldn't participate in these conversations because I'm like, mm, that ain't true. But folks would say, see, the Latinos got their stuff together. They work together to do this and do that. And they're getting this and they're getting that. And we can't ever come together. Well, yeah, if you keep saying that, then that's going to be true. And the people who are saying that are usually the first ones who are trying to argue. So when I was president of, of CBWPA, Colorado Black Women for Political Action, the thing that got me is so we would have general meetings that um, elected officials and guests were invited to. Mm -hmm. And we had black women in there treating it like it was an internal board meeting. And so one of the founders would, she would, uh, she would be sniping at me talking about, um, well, I wanted to know about, you know, are we going to participate in the, let's just say the day at the Capitol. And I was like, okay, well, we can talk about that. Um, at our next meeting, at our next board meeting, not general meeting. And she's like, well, I sent you an email, but I never heard back from you. Why you gotta say that in front of everybody? First of all, you sent it to the wrong email address. You sent it to my Gmail, not the president's email address. But see, I'm not gonna even go there. I'm not gonna even go there. But she felt it necessary and she would do that all of the time. She'd feel it necessary to put me down in front of the whole group. Mm -hmm. And then we had another one you know, the one that you used to call names. Mm, I didn't call her bad name. In front of me, you did. And so, <laughs> so this other one, she'd always come with a toot and she'd always want to argue or correct me. That's not Robert's rules of order. That's not Robert's rules of order. I said, and so I would just say, does everyone think that this, what we are doing, how we are voting on this, that everyone has been heard and that it's fair? Everybody said, yeah. I said, well, F Robert's rule of order. Like, the whole point is that, the, is that things get done fairly and in order. It does not, like if I'm not saying the right words, who cares? But these people would come to our meetings mm -hmm. just to bring me down, to argue with me, to call me out on every little thing that they thought, oh, well, we, that ain't the way we used to do it. When my day, we used to, well. Your day is past. Your day is past, <laughs> right? And so... This is one of this is one of the reasons why we haven't made more strides than we than we um, than we should have made in America. But I don't know about y'all. I was tired. 
I was tired with dealing with colonized minds and dealing with folks who have bought into someone else's view of who we are. How about you? <laughs> right? Robert's Rules of War went long. <laughs> exactly. 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 High vibe, crabs in the barrel mentality. And that, that crab in the barrel mentality, that is, that's one of the reasons why I really, really wanted to talk about this and talk about how we can start to recognize this within ourselves and not bring that stuff with us. What does it look like here? So what it could look like is within our community, everybody thinking they're in competition with everybody else. I like, I don't have any competition. Rick doesn't have any competition. We don't have any competition. We have collaborators and then we have non-collaborators, but we don't have competition. The last thing that we're going to do is compete with other people who look like us. We should be working together. But if you still buy into what other people say about us and you think you're coming from a place of deficit or from limiting beliefs, then you will bring that with you, you. Bring it with you. Yeah. and you and and you'll be over here or in Mexico or in Ecuador or in Panama or wherever it is that you want to go within the expat community. Start and mess. Start and mess. Right. That's why we can't never have nothing good. When I was confronted by the police when I was a teenager, I purposely wouldn't tell them my dad was a cop. I didn't see myself special. When they found out, it was very satisfying. You shouldn't have to, right? You should not have to. Like what I want to know, Greta, is, is, you know, did they apologize? When I was in fourth grade, I saw my dad was coming out of the bank um, after doing some business, I was waiting for him in the car. And before he got to the car, all of these police cars pulled up, wrestled him to the ground and had guns pointing at him while I was watching. They never apologized. They did not help him up. And I had to witness that. Now, what do you think I walked away from that event believing about who we were and what our value in America is, what or was. So Pinky says, nope, not afraid of talking about racism, classism, colorism, or sexism. If I find, I find it really helps weed out the truly ignorant and mm -hmm. hateful people in my life. Been a real yeah. eye opener. Indeed. Indeed. Yes, I agree totally with that. Glass Half Full says, how many of our beloved, even beloved celebrities have had surgery to change their skin and features? Oh, my God. I mean, I I think of Michael Jackson. Well, the first thing I thought of was Michael Jackson. It's like, and just looking at him through through the years, and it's like, dude, that wasn't, that wasn't him. No. No. I had a Hispanic, and I was going to marry Michael Jackson. I don't know if you know I'm that. I'm sure a lot of girls were. When I was six years old, I told my best friend, I'm marrying that man. Well, he was a boy then. I think he was 10. I had a Hispanic coworker said that her black male friend won't date black women because we are loud and bossy. And I said, he's a punk. <laughs> oh, George. And then Inside Beautiful 2, some have it, some don't. And then it's most of the times it's more important than the other kind of beauty. Yes, 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 yes. As a Baha'i, one of the premises of this faith is equality of men and women of all races, as well as the nobility of us uh, Black race. This makes it easier for us to openly speak out on racism. Yeah. That's good. That is good. And it needs to be spoken out instead of what they're trying to do in Florida and erase the history. That right there. We will not, like, I would love to get to the point where in America, we're just Americans, right? Over here, I'm just American. I'm not Black American, African American of African, well, obviously of African descent. 
Um, but that's not what they're asking. They're asking, what country am I from? I'm American. They don't say, oh, you're an African-American. No, I'm just American. Um, I don't become African-American until I live in the United States, until I'm back in the United States, right? Oh my God, this is so therapeutic. Yay, Good. we are so happy. We are so happy that this is helping um, because I know it can be uncomfortable. It, how uncomfortable were you when we started talking about this? Like we, like as of yesterday, we were not going to have this conversation. Yeah, I was in denial. I was like, okay, where are we going with this? I don't, you know, but it, and it took, it took me the night, it took me the day to think about it and go over it and actually say how wounded I am, and and you know all the things that I brushed away. But this is part of it. This is part of when somebody asks us how we're detoxing, how we're getting along, from, you know, now that we're in a foreign, uh, different country. And this is it. This is part of the process. And we didn't really start it there. So now that we're here, it's the ongoing situation, but we're learning from it. And we said, we need to get together with our community and tell them, get started on it now. Actually, I did get started with it. He just didn't know. No, she did. I didn't. Um, I told you I was raised by Sister Soldier I, I, and Malcolm X. Because I didn't think about it until when you, you had asked me, when did I uh, feel that I could start to detox or feel different? And I told you, the day I said, I'm not doing this anymore. And I didn't have to depend on anybody else. I didn't have to depend on their check to, to get me through and, and go through the things that I did. That's when I really, really realized I ain't got to do this no more. And yeah. that's what you guys are trying to do. You want to get away from that. Exactly. And and here's the thing, because these jobs don't appreciate. No. They did not appreciate, Rick. We've told you we've had six figure titles without the six figure money. And as we were talking yesterday, see, I had seen this all along, Sister Soja and Malcolm X. Does that mean that I was totally detoxed from a colonized mind? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Um, but I had been journaling about this for a very long time. So I had already admitted it to myself. And so that is number one in the healing process is journaling and making sure that you are writing down when these kind of thoughts, when limiting beliefs, limiting thoughts come into your brain, take time to pull out a piece of paper, pull out your iPad or whatever, and write down exactly what you're thinking about it. And then take the time to say, okay, now where did this come from? One of the things that I've heard in the past um, that has been really, really helpful, that it really is not the events of our past that make us crazy, self-hating, uh, anxious, or whatever. It is not the events. It's not the things that have happened to us, but it is the belief that we, what we believe about ourselves mm -hmm. and the other people that we are interacting with from that event that makes the difference. I'm not sure if that's clear for folks. So for instance, I'm gonna give a real easy example. If you are a little kid and you're asking your dad, oh dad, watch me, watch, watch me do this, watch me do this. And dad says, I'm busy right now. That kid can go away believing a lot of things about that simple event. He could go away believing, gosh, my dad works hard. I'll catch him when he's not busy. Or he could walk away saying, my dad doesn't love me. I am not lovable, right? So it is not the events that shape who we are. It's not the events. It's what we believe about ourselves from those events. And so when we see, like the Heineken commercial, when we see these ads, mm -hmm. when we when we hear when we see the images on TV in the news and how they talk about us and how we see ourselves treated, be be it, you know, us on the job or whatever. Those are not the things that shape us. It is what we decide to believe about us and how we operate in the world that changes us. And that, that, that is what we do have control over. Mm -hmm. We cannot control Karen. We cannot mm -hmm. control Ken. 
but we can control how we respond and what we believe from that event. Um, and so that's what the journaling is all about and part of the healing process. And that is one of the secrets. I learned this. It's kind of funny because, you know, I'm a recovering Catholic. And I, I remember asking the priest, why we got to go to confession? And he said, because it's really easy to admit to an invisible God what you have done wrong. And it's easy to admit to yourself, but it's harder to admit to someone else. Yes and no, right? Like, I think when it comes to this stuff, especially with our audience, who's very, you know, um, you guys are critical thinkers, you guys are smart, bright, wise folks, right? Um, because otherwise you probably wouldn't watch us. <laughs> and so I think that, you know, it may be harder to admit to ourselves. And I think that that's the first step. It might be harder to admit to ourselves that we too are still kind of brainwashed about how we see ourselves and how we see our, our community. Mm -hmm. Um, and so Vicki, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I am going to find that cause I know we're, we're down here. Vicki, thank you for the super chat. Here's thank a little you, something, Vicky. something to help as many of our people get their money together so we can get the heck out of Dodge. Yes. So I'm going to say it for those who don't know, you know, that, Every single bit of the super chat, super thanks, super sticker money goes to our scholarship fund. Um, Beyond the Bling Money Mindset Makeover for Financial Independence is our course and the information is below. We have given away two scholarships. As a matter of fact, one of our scholarship recipients was on the live yesterday. Yeah, she was. You know, and so we know that this is going and uh, to, to good use. They are, you know, participating and getting everything that they can get out of the course. So and thank you, Vicki. So thank you so, 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 so much. We appreciate it. Um, okay, so number one is journal journaling. So we're gonna, I'm gonna ask some questions and now we're gonna get to the soft part. Um, because we have- The soft part? Yeah. There's the, a soft there's part? There's a soft part. What has been good about being black? Can you answer that? What's, what has been good about being, yes. being black? When do I remember being strongly supported by another black person? What makes me proud about being black? That Those are the questions that I want you to ask yourself and put in the chat. Um, and interestingly, I got you, Greta. Interestingly, um, one of the things, all right, so Tim Wise is an anti-racist activist, and I've had the privilege to meet him and get to know him a little bit. And one of the things that he would always say is that, you know, we had more pride for our community than his community does. And that there, there does not seem to be. So with that, don't let them be black, don't let them be black, don't let them be black. <laughs> with that, the other side of that is we all recognize that we are interconnected and we are all part of this one community. Mm, yeah. So there's the positive side to that, because when you ask us, you know, what is good about being black? What makes you proud of being black? It is, you know, that our community has 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 come up regardless of all of the oppression that we have managed. I mean, we're really, really strong. First of all, we made it across that middle passage. Come on now, y'all. Yeah. Some people didn't make it. So those who made it were the best of the best, the strongest of the strong, both physically, mentally and spiritually. It took a lot to get across. And so those of us that have survived since then and who have managed to carve out a life that look, has some semblance of joy and happiness and contentment, even better, right? And we want that for our whole community. Yes. He said he did not see that kind of community commitment on the other side. And I thought that was very, very interesting. Um, Thank you, D.Y. Thank, thank you for you the so super much. sticker. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And I think we might be close to having enough for, for another scholarship. So thank you so much. We appreciate it. So 
What do you like about being black? When do you remember being strongly supported by another black person? And what makes me so proud of being black? Can you answer any of those? I truly am proud of our people. I'm I'm a pr- I'm proud, you know, where we've come, what we've come from, and where we, you know, we're we're striving ahead. We're we're continually moving, and and getting things done, you know. And I just hope we keep moving forward and not getting hammered down or, or hindered. You know, just don't stop us. Don't let us stop ourselves. Because everybody, you know, you always point this out to me, our, our, our culture, our, our music, the things that we do that people just love. That's what I was about. That's where I was going. You know, so my, I talk about my daddy a lot because I'm a daddy's girl. But he used to say, everybody wants to get next to the magic. Everybody wants to get, yeah, have that rub off on. Right. Wherever. So you guys are travelers. You know this. Our culture is the global culture when it comes to cool. Anything that is cool, hip, uh, um, modern, all of that stuff, we create it. And I don't mean black folks, I mean black Americans because that's where hip hop was started, right? And the hip hop culture and every everything that goes along with that and its permutations, is that, is that word? Of where we are today with it. Uh, whatever that is today, it is global. When you see people who cannot speak English in Korea or someplace rapping and doing our dances, and then of course making money off of it. That's the thing that gets me. That's what makes me angry. So I love, love, love. Um, I love the fact that there is a a creativity about our lives that has shaped basically the artistic creativity of the globe. And hundreds of years from now, when they look back, like when we study the arts and stuff like that from from times past, right? Wars and things like that, that may tell you who's in charge, but the art is what tells you about the humanity of a culture. Okay, and that's why it's important. I don't care what they say. It is important. It is the most important because it's 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 an expression of humanness. And so hundreds of years from now, they're going to look back at this time. It'll be very interesting to see what they say. Will we get will we get the credit for creating basically another renaissance and another art form and all of that? Thank you, Greta Thank Cobb. You, Greta. Thank you so much, so much, so much. Um, so, it, yeah, I, that's one of the things that I really, really love about our community. The other thing that I love about being Black is that, um, besides the fact that I prefer our churches and our music, is that we are the original people. The You know, we know that modern society, modern humans all come from Africa. And so I like being the mom of the planet. Hello. Um, All right, so let's see what you guys are saying. Our joy and faith is our superpower. That's right. Oh yeah. I am proud of my family and my upbringing, the struggle of my ancestors before me. We survive. We survive, y'all, and then go ahead and thrive, right? So, you know, my all my my maternal paternal, I don't know what you call that, like my mom's father's parents were born on the plantation. My mom's mom was not born on the plantation. She was a bit younger, um, but she was, you know, she was a, a maid. I don't know how well she was paid, and I do know that the person that she worked for raped her and that is how my grandmother was came to be so when we talk about can't you guys just get over it and stuff like that like when rick was a kid we were talking about this when rick was a kid he lived in a segregated housing project Mm -hmm. it was segregated y'all the cemetery was segregated 
when he was a kid. So we're not talking about stuff that was from a long time ago. Yeah, that didn't change until I grew. Well, I was a grown man. Exactly. It, see? And there's parts of it that are still segregated. I mean, it's against the law. We are amazing and creative and resilient. Why would anyone deny themselves the pleasure of our company? Exactly. Exactly. Question. Rick and Halisi, do you feel free? Are you expecting a different kind of free? Are you, yeah, are experiencing? Yes. And sometimes we have to remember that. Um, it, you know, I have to catch myself. I have to catch myself and remind myself I'm not in the United States. I, you know, I don't have to do certain things, especially when it comes to shopping and being followed around a store, stuff like that, right? That's the thing that still kind of weighs. Um, I stopped the, on the workplace, I stopped that a while ago because I was tired. I was like, I'm not putting on these airs anymore. I'm just not, I'm just not. But, and, and I've been pretty privileged in America when it comes to interactions with the police. So I didn't have that trauma. I saw it with my dad, so I was always afraid for the males in our family. But I felt as a female, I you know, which is ridiculous because how many of us have died at the hands of our police innocently, right? Um, well, we were innocent, mm -hmm. um, so it was really stupid of me to and ignorant and and to think that I was somehow immune because I was a woman. But I just never had any negative interactions. I've been pulled over enough times to have had negative interactions, but I've been very fortunate. Very, very fortunate. The experience of being black. I love knowing the truth and defying the lies. Hey, Rui. Defying the lies. I love knowing the truth too. I no longer care about defying the lies. I no longer care what they think. And it's interesting because when we first got here, mm. we went to, you were thinking that too, right? Mm. We went to dinner with um, some friends of ours. Well, one we didn't know, he happened to be a white guy. And, um, and then our friend Tuana. And so we were having this frank conversation about racism and he's like, First of all, he said to Twana, you never talk this way in front of me. And he says, I've never heard this kind of conversation before, which is interesting since he helps import things from the continent of Africa. Yeah. <laughs> but OK, so he had never heard things like this before. And I said, well, I probably would not have been as candid as I'm being now in the past, depending upon who you were. But now that I don't have to depend on people who look like you for my paycheck, All bets are off, baby. Feeling like an insider when I see other black people, it's the nod. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. I just, I love us. I mean, I I I don't hate anybody. Um, I'm less trusting of other people, um, you know. But I love us. And I remember when I was still, I was really young. I was the Jabari wasn't even born, so I was under 28 years old, and I was trying to find something in LA during the. 80s or 90s, this is the 90s, and early 90s though, so the crack thing was still going on, right? And there was a group of black guys in the front yard of some house. So I pull over to ask for the ask directions. And the one guy comes over to the window, he says, you know, I, I saw them pass by and then I backed up and then asked for them, asked for directions. And of course, no cell phones in these days, or I had a cell phone, but no GPS, right? He says, I'm surprised that you stopped and to ask us. And I was like, why? He said, well, you know, a group of black guys, you know, I, now I'm black. And I said, and I said to him, should I be afraid of my own people? I, I really did not get that. Right. I mean, I, I just didn't get it. Yeah. I didn't get it. Right. Um, yeah, we survive, absolutely. Our joy, our faith, yes. Um, the fact that we are standing on the backs of our ancestors who made it through, and now I know I can too. That's right, Pam. That's right. 
I think the free for our login was before Obama. It might have been. It, it might have. I don't know. Blame Obama. <laughs> Thanks, Obama. <laughs> Um, I love the flavor of our people and at how we have survived and thrived. Yep. I like that, the flavor, because we are flavored people. We are. We definitely are. We definitely are. Um, what has been most difficult about being Black? I think we've talked about that. Why do I want Black people to know? What do I want Black people to know about me? When have I, how have I been hurt by my own people? When do I remember standing up against the mistreatment of one black person by another black person? So one of the things that Gloria Vinson, <laughs> our food, yeah. One of the, the, my mom's Gloria Vinson. She said she married my dad. She said, I found the darkest man I could because I didn't want no yellow babies. The colorism mm. oh in our God. own community. Like I said earlier, when I was talking about the little boy, he's black enough. Or, um, you know, my mom is very fair. She's got sh straight hair. You're not really black. You're not black enough. You know, all of that stuff that we do to each other. Um, in the family. My, in the family. My, my grandmother not liking my mother. Because she was too dark. To too dark. Yep. Yep. My, I, my, she ended up loving my mother because my mother would do anything and everything in the world. She knew she could count on my mother. But that first thing, because my father was very fair skinned, it was very fair skinned. And, you know, some of his brothers too, but he had a brother was, that was my complexion and on my mother's complexion. And my grandmother actually thought that my mother was too dark for her son. Yeah. Yeah, that paper bag test. Remember that stuff, y'all? Yeah, it, it's it's crazy <laughs> when it, you grow up and and you find these things out about you know members in your family and stuff like that. My uncle did not like my aunt nor my dad. They were too dark for the family. He had convinced. This is how this is how the sickness looks when it's at its extreme. He had convinced himself that my great grandmother was not his mother and that the slave master's daughter was actually his mother. I remember him saying, I'm not a Negro. <laughs> <laughs> I usually watch you without saying anything or on the replay. I just want to say thank you for having this conversation today. Oh, thank you, Purple <laughs> Tulip. Thank you and welcome to the chat. Yes, <laughs> I love our culture. I do. I mean, when when we do the things that we do that are uniquely us, I I just it just I don't know. It brings me joy. After it, go ahead. It, you know, the thing and I think it's a question that's coming up, what's difficult? So I'll wait till you get to that. No, no, no. What's what has been difficult what about has being been black? Difficult, I read that already. It's oh you did, I'm sorry. It's What's been difficult, and it's not me being difficult or us being difficult, the difficulty is having people understand how loving of uh, people, people we are. are. Yeah. How forgiving we are. Yeah. And to have everybody, you know, putting all this information and all these different things about black people out, it's like we're not out, you know, we're not out to get you. We're not lazy. We're very hard working. We built a nation. We built the United States of America. Yeah. <laughs> Come yeah. on. Our blood, sweat, and tears. But when we started asking for money, we became lazy. Yeah. So, yeah, we endured, Evelyn. So we that's, endured. That's just difficult to me. And, and I'm so glad that I can take that and put it to the side because to think about it just drives me crazy. Brings yeah. Me back. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, they said it when when Obama was running for office. They said the hillbillies over in West Virginia said, "We can't let the blacks get in charge because then they'll do to us what we did to them." Yeah. So my mama used to always say, "You accuse people of doing the things that you would do yourself." Cheaters accuse their spouses of cheating. Liars accuse other people of lying etc. Perseverance, strength, brilliance, family values. Yes, 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 yes. 
We didn't get to get the 200 on the Monopoly board, but we still managed to cross so many finish lines anyhow. And still we rise. That's right, Tanya. Uh, that's right. I finished watching High on the Hog this morning. We are amazing. I haven't seen that. I don't even know what it is, but I'll look it up. Art tells us about our humanity. It does, Monica. It really, really does, right? I mean, that's why we study, you know, the Renaissance period and the this period and the that period. Um, we study the humanity of who people are through the art that they created. When I saw the Obamas at the White House and it is still messing with their, I know it's still messing with their minds. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, but you know, the good part about it is we, we got to see who was who. They weren't, they weren't afraid to, to, to show their ugly. And so we got to see who was who. We have to get ourselves uh, for surviving because we aren't supposed to be here right now. Yep, we were supposed yeah. to be free. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mind us too, high vibe. Mind us too. But they stopped doing that. They stopped doing that. Hey, Patty, I sent you an email. Just get over it. We cannot get over something that is still happening. Now, in, in other words, like we can get over it internally. We can get over it as an internal group, but we're certainly not going to get over it when it comes to changing the systems. We are going to continue to change the systems. I'm not going to be marching anymore, working in politics anymore, making any more phone calls, faxing any more people. But what we can do is change the way we internalize this and the way we treat each other. And then we can teach each other about what internalized racism looks like when we as a group are not suffering at the levels of an eight, nine and 10 from internalized racism, they, the system will change. Mm -hmm. It will change because we will demand that it will change. Right. Um, these kids ain't putting up with a lot of this stuff and there's still sundown towns all oh, over yeah. the country. Yep. Yeah. It does. And so the other thing that the other reason why we wanted to bring this up, because, you know, we talk about money. Our consumerism is so closely tied to our self-esteem and our self-esteem is so closely tied to internalized racism. Our consumerism is closely tied to our self-esteem, which is closely tied to our internalized racism. It is going to be very, very hard for us to stop being extreme consumers if that is how we view our self-esteem, if our self-esteem is tied up into the stuff that we have, right? Mm -hmm. And so if minimalism makes you itchy, question why. Now, I'm not saying that everybody has to be sitting here wearing the same thing over and over and over again and stuff like that. I'm not saying that. But if you're buying so much that you're in debt, there's no difference between that and smoking that crack pipe. An addiction is an addiction and it is keeping you in bondage. Mm. And y'all, I want us to be truly, truly free, free, really free. My mom went to segregated schools right here in Indianapolis, right? It limited her opportunities. Oh, yeah. Right. Get over it indeed. That's right. That's right. The question is hard for me because I love our looks, creativity, music, food, and culture. However, given a choice, I wouldn't choose to be black. It's just too hard. I remember when my son came to me and said, I wish I were white. He was a little boy. My father was so upset. I said, what are you so upset about? He looks around and he sees who's getting treated well and who's not who's getting privilege in the classroom and who's not. Yeah. And his five-year-old brain said, I want to be like that. Of course, but it hurt my heart. It hurt my heart, but I get it. Like I, now when I was in sixth grade, I wrote this poem about this and I, and I can't say Shana that, that I've ever felt this way. And this is why. So when I was in sixth grade, I wrote this poem about the difference about being black and not. And it came, you know what I'm going with this, mm -hmm. right? And it came to me because our teacher was teaching us about, and I was going to go camping too. So she was teaching us about how you can tell which water is good to drink, safe to drink, is pure, and which water isn't. And she, and so, you know, we know that if it's 
going over a stream, if it's running water, getting hit by the rocks and this and that, and tumbling over the rocks and all of that stuff, um, that it is pure water. And if it's a pond that is still with no movement, it gets toxic. And I was like, ah, just like us, just like us. It, or like, if you don't go through anything, it's hard to really have true compassion for other folks. And so in my 11 year old mind, black people were the water getting tumbled over the rocks consistently. And in my 11 year old mind, that made us more pure, pure at heart. That's where I went. That's where I went with that. I would push the button to be black woman every time. We are so beautiful inside and out and we come in every flavor and oh, to be with a strong black man, pure fantasy. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Hey Rui, we have a black prime minister for seven years already. What's his name or her name? Or is it the person who's in there right this, now? This dude. Did I said he looks black? Mm. <laughs> Tell us, Rui, is it the guy who's in there now? Because I was like, he looks black. <laughs> I, I better say it. He looks black. It, it, when, when English is not your first language, I know it's hard to understand Ebonics. Same, because I'm not really melanated kids. At that. I'm not really melanated kids in my school were so cruel. I wanted brown babies. Oh, talking about my mom. Yes. <laughs> We do, we do, Professor. Oh, that lie, that yeah. lie is what you're talking about. I don't wanna say the words because of YouTube algorithm, but yes, 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 yes. And you know, they need to detox from that as well. It is oh, dangerous yeah. and it is killing them as well. And they don't realize it because they, you know, they, because they, they see the privilege that they also get. But in, in being blind to that, they miss when things are coming, right? And so they don't see when, like the opioid epidemic. It, you know, if we had put in place a decriminalization of drugs back in the 90s during the crack cocaine epidemic, when, you know, they were all criminals, as opposed to a health issue, had we decriminalized it then, had we had mandated rehab and hospitalization then, maybe less of them would have died now from the opioid pandemic. In NOLA, there was a thing called the paper bag test. Yes, and my people are from New Orleans, or not from New Orleans, but from Louisiana. Mm -hmm. I hate the colorism in our family. It's so sad and so hard. Oh yes. Um, and, you know, my grandmother grew up speaking that uh, French Cajun stuff, right? Um, but she never called herself Creole, interesting, interestingly enough. I grew up thinking the darker a person was, the more beautiful they were. Good. I fantasized to marry a black man as dark as possible. Unfortunately, they prefer lighter women. Only lighter men like me. <laughs> yeah, we see that a lot. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You know... Um, you guys know about the doll test, right? Well, all these babies were asked, which doll would you pick? Which doll is prettier? Which doll is nicer? And all of that. And so many of our babies picked the white baby doll. Rick and I were talking about that. And I was like, I would have never picked the white baby doll. Because my mama told me when I was young, I didn't have any baby dolls until they started making black baby dolls. She's like, you will never have a white baby. So I'm not buying you a white baby doll. When they make this doll in black, then you can have one of those. So I always knew I embrace my blackness, but if this is a safe place where I can be honest, I would not choose to be black. No, no, no. I get it, Shauna. I get it. I get it. It like that's rational. That is rational right. thought. Like who would want to come into this life being discriminated against, right? Um, I get it. Shoot. It's a terrible struggle to be black in America. It's really hard. Like who would choose, who would choose to to be the whooping, the whooping boy or the whooping girl, right? That everything is blamed on, right? No matter what we do, it's not good until somebody else takes what we do and makes it their own and then monetizes it, right? Like, nah. 
If you're fair skinned and from the streets, you're called red, educated, and high yellow. So, bruh. <laughs> I had never heard the term red bone until I married this man. I had never heard that before. So even though in my family, we're from, New we're from Louisiana, both sides, my dad's side and my mom's side, there was not a lot of colorism spoken in my world. So when I was younger, no one ever used the N word. Like my uncle uses it day and night now. And I was really surprised by that. But, you know, and light skinned, light skinned it with good hair mm. and all of that stuff that like I, I never heard that in our house. It my grandparents, both sets of grandparents never heard it, you know, um, and never heard it from my parents, never heard it from my immediate aunts and uncles. Now, my great uncle, he was a little cray cray. He would say some crazy stuff, but he was already he was already pigeonholed as the crazy one. Right. Oh, you know, Uncle Lim, you know, so you never took what he said seriously. Yeah, we built this thing for free. Mm -hmm. We built it for free. It's obviously hard to be black when so many say a good thing about being black is surviving and enduring. I don't look forward to the struggle. And that's why we're having this conversation. Because if we can, look, our struggle is not necessarily, like the, for the majority of the folks who are watching this, our struggle is not necessarily the system 100%. And why do I say that? Because very few of the people who watch our channel are in poverty. Um, some are. I understand that. And some are working two and three jobs. I understand that. But by and large, because we've talked to y'all and y'all make more money than we make. So why are why don't we have the wealth to walk away, to have that freedom to not be persecuted? Right. That's why we want to have this conversation, because until we let go of some of this stuff, first recognize it by journaling and let go of some of this stuff. We will continue to be that slave oh, of debt, yeah. right? Um, so let's let's wrap this up. Um, so once you are journaling and you have admitted this stuff to yourself, <laughs> then you have to commit to making those bold steps. And I'm going to tell you, this was very hard for Rick. This was hard. Like I recognized this stuff in him a decade ago. I recognized that he was holding holding himself back at work, that he refused to demand what he was due. And I know that that was because of internalized racism. It's true. But he didn't realize it. It's very true. And he used to say, and I, I used to say, it's, that's racism. He's like, and he would get so angry and say, well, there's nothing we can do about it. Yeah, you can walk away. That's what we can do. Tell them to go take their job and shut it. That's what we can do. But if you don't believe, if you are in that, that category where you're still trying to prove yourself, then it's a little bit harder to just walk away, isn't it? So we have to commit ourselves to taking bold steps towards overcoming these habits and internalized colonialism and racism. So if you've written it down, if you're starting to recognize those patterns, then when that thought comes back up, you can nip it in the butt. You can nip it in the butt and say, no, I'm not going to go there. That is not true. I don't believe that about myself. Now, it may be true that Karen is going to act like Karen's going to act, but I am going to believe what I want to believe about myself. And then the, the next thing that we have to do, and it's kind of all wrapped together, is make sure that we are telling our children, our loved ones, mm -hmm. our family, our adopted family, uh, calling them on it when you see it with love, right? And then helping to fight either the system or the system within our own community. And why do I say it like that? Because we're tired. We have been fighting all of our lives and I'm not fighting the system anymore. The way I fight the system is to educate y'all so you can get out. They need to feel the pain of not having us as their whipping stick anymore anymore. Um, 
So continually share information about overcoming internalized oppression with other members of our community. <laughs> yeah. Right? Right? So, all right, y'all. All right, I think we've done it. Yes, the oppressor's deepest fear, the oppressed overcoming. Yeah, it, it is. It is. It is. Recent research shows that Black women are among the most educated in the United States. Uh -huh. Very true. Very true. I remember when I was maybe 25, 26 years old, and me and a friend of ours, she went to USC, and we were going to a birthday party of one of her former classmates who was at that time on the Raiders, LA Raider. So it was a birthday party full of all these jocks, all these Raiders were there. She and I were the only black women in the house. It was a party, y'all. We were the only black women in the house. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Can you help American Democrats vote in Portugal? <laughs> they, they look, uh, the Democratic Party is here. Um, Democrats abroad, it's here. Um, and it's different state to state. I'll remind folks, I'll remind folks, but you know. I hate the light skin comments, jokes, or because I live in a certain part of the city, I suddenly don't know nothing about that, right? I deal with this daily at my black owned black pla uh, place of work. Yeah. Yeah. This, these are the things that we do to each other. That's what we do to each other. Right? A white boy told me to get over it back when I lived in Atlanta. I told him, why don't y'all stop reenacting the Civil War? <laughs> that right there. That right there. Look, if you told a Jewish person to get over the Holocaust. Yeah, that doesn't work out too good. You, you would be called an anti-Semite. Oh, yeah. But we're supposed to get over it. Something that is currently happening. Right? My grandmother used to say, watch who you have your babies by. My aunt and uncle used to call each other blackies as an insult. Oh, yeah. These are the things that we yeah. do to each other, right? Right? I wish I was a minimalist. Well, become one, Dan. You can do it. Become one. High on the Hog is a documentary about African-American food. Oh, throughout our history and culture and its connections to Africa. Okay. okay. No wonder, like when we talk about Cape Verde food, we got to go back and get that. I know, and it's close. We got this, Trey. We got this. We got this. Nah, with all due respect, I love my black skin. Yes, 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 yes. I do too. But I understand. I understand um, what Sister Girl was talking about. I think it was Shauna. I understand. A colleague asked, why only date black? Because everyone wants, needs to be us, emulates us, imitates us, are willing to destroy us because we are so amazing. We are, we really are. And um, that's a beautiful analogy. How you see black people are the water going over the rocks. Yes, we are. Sister Soja and Malcolm X, y'all. Portugal once did bad things, very bad things. Slave trade, colonialism. Yep, but we learn from that. No more. Now we now integrate all kinds of people, black, white, yellow. We don't have anything with green people, Rui. We learn from our <laughs> mistakes. <laughs> I, well, unless you're sick. Yeah. I mean, and that's the thing. America's not learning from its mistakes. And I, I have a feeling that we are seeing the, the decline of America. They're doubling down on their mistakes. I love being black down. because of my beautiful melanated skin and infinite innate wisdom. Yes, Michelle. Yes, yes, yes. Um, thank you, Tan. Auntie Trey, great conversation. Very good. I think we're going to wrap this up. So he is black. That's him. Okay, yeah. She said it. The first she saw it, she said, he look at her. I said, yeah, I know. He does. <laughs> Some, one of them. Mama, that somebody. Somebody. Auntie Trey, I admit I'm spoiled. I hope we can find decent furniture. And, and, yeah, well, yeah, I'm a little spoiled too. Ooh, that was weird. 
That was weird. Did you see that? Yeah. It's everything disappeared for a second. Said how colorism yeah. is ingrained in American culture. It is. It's not just American culture, right? Colorism is everywhere. Um, that's why there's skin bleaching creams. They're using that in Africa and making themselves sick. They're using it in Asia and making themselves sick. It's everywhere. It's not just us. Color doesn't matter. It's content and character to me. Um, I had whoopsie and black Barbie. I cut Barbie's fro and her heart away. It don't grow back. <laughs> It does not grow back. So many challenges in our community. I'm an older black gay man. I've never found a place where I fit in. Thank you so much for everything that you've shared with us today. You are so welcome, so Peyton. Welcome. So welcome. You are so welcome. And you know, and that's and so that's another thing. Um, you know, when we're talking about our community and intersectionality, right? Like uh, we had. I'm trying to find this, y'all. Okay, I'm going to go down to the bottom and come back up. Thank you, my piece. Thank, thank you for you, the super piece. sticker. Thank you, thank you, thank you. As always, you know it goes to the scholarship fund. So that's that's another thing. Like the whole divide and conquer and the brainwashing that has been done in the Black church. And I'm going to tell you, I think, I want to say Alicia Renice, the artist, also did a video on this the hurt that the black the the hurt and pain that the black church um, um, causes, right? Whether it be against our LGBTQ brothers and sisters, or this false sense of a time in America when we were better, right? It's that whole notion when stupid Cosby came out trying to downgrade our. Uh, our black fathers, like all black fathers were this and all black fathers were that. And we need to do this and we need to do that. It's like, are, are you serious right now? Yeah. So. V, I can understand what you said. Okay, I returned yesterday from spending a month in Puerto Vallarta and I'm re I'm already sad to be home. I'm sorry, baby. I know that feeling. I know that feeling. All right, y'all. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing. For this. sharing everything for with open. us, for being open. <laughs> yes. Um, Honest. Yes. Hope you got something from it. Yes, definitely. If, 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 you know, just the notion to start detoxing now so when you do go to another place, uh, whatever place you choose, that you can free yourself. Yeah, there is a freedom, there is a joy, there is a peace. And if you can start journaling and working on this now, then when you leave the toxicity of America, you won't take old you with us, with you, but bring you new mm -hmm. with you. Um, no, Auntie Trey, I did not hear the connection uh, between relaxer and cancer, but I'm not surprised. Yeah, I've heard I'm that. I'm not surprised. Have you? Yeah. I mean, it seeps into your scal scalp. You know, I would think it causes brain cancer. I don't know. I don't know. Um, for those of you who are going to be here in April, you know we're having a meetup on April 26th. We've partnered with Black in Portugal, and that information is below. Our summer meetup is in June, on June 20th. And I think we're adding a boat trip to that. So, you know, June, summertime, of course we are. So I'm gonna see if I can make that happen. And that information is below if you wanna get on the mailing list so that you get the information. So April 26th and June 20th. And? To our Portuguese family, Rui, yes. V, George. <laughs> George. Yeah. I mean, Thanks for hanging out. They're amazing. Thanks. They are truly amazing in, in giving information and stuff. Like yeah, that. definitely. And thanks for hanging out and listening to something that is very African American centric or North American Black eccentric. And you will see Ruri when we put this uh, the opera video out. He's yes. the one that took us around the opera house and, and you know gave us history and stuff of what was going on with the opera house. So he's in that. So we hope you enjoy that. We'll be putting that out very very soon. 
Definitely, definitely. We love you guys. We love you. Thank you, BP. Yes, the Yarbros did something about the Yarbros are really good about bringing this up and 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 seeing the black communities and all the Latin uh, countries that they've been to lately. So. Um, you know, we love the Yarbrough. You know, they've been on this on this show as well, on our channel as well. We love you, and we will see you on Thursday. Bye. Bye.